Hello, everyone. Welcome to SuperCloud 7. I'm the guest host here. Today, I have, I'm very honored to have two distinguished guests, Simon and uh, Diptano. And I will let them introduce their background first and their company, and then we will get right into the tough questions. Awesome. Thanks for the introduction. I'm Simon, the co-founder and CTO of Llama Index. Um, we are a generative AI platform for enterprise. Um, what we do is providing a very easy to use toolkit for generative AI developers to very quickly prototype and productionize AI applications in the enterprise setting. Before this, I was uh, a research scientist in the self-driving industry. I spent five years building generative AI models for simulating human driving behaviors for the purpose of testing and training self-driving cars. So through that process, I got a lot of first-hand experience dealing with the, these stochastic systems that can be very powerful, but also very difficult to work well with uh, in building very uh, robust applications. Um, before that, I got my PhD from University of Toronto and got my uh, undergrad uh, bachelor's degree in computer science at University of Waterloo. So maybe I'll pass it on for now. Yeah, cool. Uh, I'm Diptano, uh, founder and CEO of uh, Tensor Lake. And uh, we're a serverless AI infrastructure company. Uh, we have an open source project called Indexify, which helps uh, software engineers build pipeline uh, to consume unstructured data in LLMs. And uh, uh, before Tensor Lake, uh, I was at Facebook for almost seven years. I was the tech lead of the machine learning platform there, FB Learner. Then I was the tech lead for the speech inference engine team. And uh, way back in time, almost a decade back, I worked on Apache Mesos and Spark when I was at Netflix. And then I wrote another cluster scheduler at HashiCorp called Nomad. It's also open source. And uh, yeah. Cool. You know, both of you have a pretty strong open source background. But today we are going to talk about generative AI, large language model applications primarily. Um, I said a tough questions. It's actually tough or maybe easy for you because, you know, that's what you do day to day. The question I have in mind is, you know, uh, in December uh, 2023, CNBC had, had an article. Uh, the title of the article is, 2023 was a breakout year for generative AI. Everyone agreed, right? It was a year that, uh, it's a year of um, hefty profits for NVIDIA and then lofty experiments for everyone else. Um, and uh, it's only the middle of the year. And uh, in the last uh, six, six months or so, I've been asking people, you know, when are we going to be out of that, you know, lofty experiments for others? Um, based on everything I observed, you know, potentially, possibly by December 2024, CNBC can just republish that article and then people will still say, yeah, that's about right. Hefty profits for NVIDIA and a lofty experiments for uh, everyone else. Now, with, with all the sort of the um, comments aside, I wanted to know, you know, what's, re what's really happening, right? Because you, you guys are working with real customers who has every motivation to get a generative AI into large production state. Many of them run into issues or challenges Otherwise, they wouldn't be interacting with you closely. So give me some, you know, some insights into you know, what are the challenges people are running into so that we, are, we don't see too many or enough large-scale production deployments yet. Uh, maybe I can go first. Uh, so I, you know, I think, uh, it, the, you know, we, we have, as an industry, we have done amazing in making it easy for developers to tinker with LLMs, uh, Llama Index especially. Um, you know, they, they have made it really easy for someone to fire up a notebook, uh, load some PDFs, and build a RAG application in two minutes. And it's really easy to show some initial value and build an MVP that looks really cool, uh, especially coming from software 1.0. And now you, your software is much more fluid, and your MVP works really well. But I think you know this is just the start of the journey, right? Uh, what people usually want is they want LLMs to know everything about their enterprise, their customers, and so on. That's the holy grail of Gen AI application that people are generally trying to get to. And in an enterprise, data lives in a lot of different places. Data is of different shapes. And so the same demo that really works well on a notebook doesn't work in production because 
of just because the messiness of the data like all across your business. And B is security, right? Just because data is accessible doesn't mean everybody uh, using the generative AI application should have access to it. So a lot of work that has happened in RBAC and role-based access controls and things like that in the last 20 years, I've, I just think people are still struggling with that when it comes to like building an LLM application with enterprise data, right? And third is reliability and scalability. It's cool to like build an application with five PDFs, but when you have to do it with like tens of thousands of PDFs or you have to incorporate different models in a pipeline, uh, it becomes tricky, right? The same notebook that someone has built to use a product to, to an MVP doesn't really scale to production. So that journey takes longer, right? Um, th that journey involves like doing things related to data governance, doing things related to making sure all the T's are crossed like from a security perspective and understanding that the accuracy scales to even production, right? That someone had uh, at the time of doing MVP. And last, I think, if you have a successful application after doing all these things, then comes the unit economics, right? I was at Facebook, you know, we had a really amazing speech recognition engine. It was really hard to like deploy a very accurate model in production if the model was too big because the data center footprint would increase a lot. And I think the same thing applies here. It's just that, you know, you have a successful MVP or, or like a, a uh, cool demo doesn't mean like it's going. The unit economics is going to work out at the end. So there is just like, a lot of like myriad of problems that lies ahead from building an MVP to going into production. So and it's not just one problem, right? Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. just about do I understand the table, the graph of a PDF file, but also I have so so many varieties of the yeah. you know multimedia yeah. sort of things, and then doing that at scale, doing yeah. that with the um, you know, reasonable access control. Exactly, yeah. Cool. Simon. Yeah, just to add on that to that little bit, I think the promise of LM being AGI and all is, is generality, right? I think we have this expectation for this technology to solve a lot of our problems. And I think that's not really the greatest starting point for a lot of those to drive success. I think when people think about LM and data, there are a full spectrum of different use cases they're trying to tackle that have different challenges. Um, so in terms of the query complexity, there are very, very different scales of challenge when you come to factual questions or analysis questions or full like report generation questions, right? And I think we've not paid enough attention about you know, deeply understanding the business use case how much cost and latency we can afford for each of those, and allocating the right amount of engineering resources and build the right tools for those different use cases. And like you mentioned earlier, on the data side, this is another axis in which there's a wide variety of challenges about complex layouts, sort of visually rich documents. And when people build these prototypes, they've focused on one very narrow slice and kind of thought of, imagine that it would generalize well for all of those, but when it does get to those different type of medias, we do need to build out additional capabilities to tackle those. So I think this like, the cross, the cross product, those two problems are really what people haven't really anticipated well. And um, at Lama Index, what we've been building is trying to create all these components that can tackle different aspects of these problems and empower the developers to kind of compose them together. I think one of the big theses we have is that a lot of those business challenges, it's best for sort of the developer within the organization to be able to compose the low level tooling to tackle them rather than having a single solution solve for that. So yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why you know, we haven't seen as much adoption or success, but we're definitely getting there. Yeah, you know, the a year ago, well, for more than a year, uh, companies like Llama Index. I would say Llama Index is one of the you know bigger contrib contributors of uh, so many uh, best practices to do how to do rag you know those things in the last one year. Uh, in some ways, it's tremendously helping the community you know at large, but also give certain people the perception oh just to read this you know what Simon or Jerry wrote and then I can build it. And uh, to your point, it may take two minutes or take two weeks, yeah. but in reality, is you know so many. Uh, new pro uh, so many problems uh, people didn't anticipate you know about it what a year ago or you know more than a year ago so 
thanks for sharing with those insights. Now, with that, you know, as you said, people are getting there, moving there. What is your, what, what do you see, right? You know, do you see that, you know, in, in another half a year, we should see large um, deployment left and right, or, hey, this is a journey. Well, it will take time. We will make progress, but, you know, you are cautious. What do you see out there? Yeah, um, maybe I'll take a stab at that first. Um, I think within the people who are working with, there's definitely a full spectrum of maturity, and uh, it ranges from, like, large financial services investment organizations who have productionized some of those um, financial assistance uh, to the orders of thousands or tens of thousands of employees. And so on the other spectrum, like people are just iterating and building a lot of prototypes quickly to be able to gain PMF on the individual applications. So we, th we see both ends of the spectrum and um, it's hard to give a concrete timeline in terms of like the broad market, but we're pretty optimistic about like a lot of the repetitive workflows already being automated fairly reliably. I think one concrete example is like being able to extract financial information from documents and automatically build these financial models, which uh, previously will take uh, a financial analyst maybe a full day to kind of scrub those information and manually do that and now it's in the order of like minutes or hours. So I think those things make me super optimistic and even with the current level of capability um, we're able to drive a lot of value in those cases. But I think we're still a little bit far away from the fully autonomous agent that people are imagining that will fully replace an individual employee. Cool. Yeah, uh, to add to that I feel like you know, every cycle has its uh, has that takes the time of uh, of maturity curve, right? Like you know, we saw this with mobile, we saw this with the cloud. Um, it takes a couple of years to for for companies to adopt something new, and uh, even if like there are some employees in in that in that enterprise like experimenting with something, it takes a couple of years to get to the production. Uh, in every cycle, I think in this cycle it's going to be much faster, just because I think the uh, the way we deliver software has changed in the last 10 years, right? Uh, 10 years back, uh, there was not a lot of like SaaS or serverless companies or platforms that uh, engineers could access. Like you would see people building these platforms internally. And now, you know, I, I think, you know, we are making a lot of progress towards delivering APIs as a service that engineers can access and uh, accelerate their development process to going to production. Uh, so, Again, like like Simon was saying, I don't have a timeline, but it would be a lot faster than we have seen in the past with other. Yeah, uh, compared to the previous yeah. few generations yeah. of the new technology yeah. mm -hmm. or replatformization, yeah. I think you know it's uh, it is going to be faster. I also agree. So we talked about a lot of challenges, and then I would love to hear about you know some pathway forward, right? You know, both of you are developing some interesting applications. How do you see yourself play some critical role, right? You know, the insights you can share with people that you can help people to sort of adopt this generative AI faster or, you know, better or see the, see the return faster. Um, uh, I, I can uh, t take it first. Uh, you know, so w Tensor Lake is in the business of making it easy for uh, developers to consume infrastructure for building AI applications. What I mean by that is, if you are working with a lot of documents or images or videos even, um, you need to figure out like how do you integrate models um, in your pipelines, right? And once you have pipelines which are able to process unstructured data, then comes the pro time of like, you know, of consuming them into an LLM application uh, using like a framework like Llama Index and so on. And, uh, uh, we want to solve the hard infrastructure problems, you know, something that would take uh, very senior engineers a year to build. You know, we want software engineers to have platforms where they can uh, do this in minutes. Like, to give you a concrete example, if you are building uh, a knowledge base based on audio and you want to understand uh, conversations that people are having on phone, like on sales calls and things like that, uh, to do this at scale, uh, it usually takes uh, months for engineers to build a reliable platform where streams can be extracted and you get transcriptions and then you get all the embeddings and so on. With, with Tensor Lake, you know, it's a matter of like minutes. You set up a pipeline, 
uh, you set up all the stages in the pipeline and then you throw like tens of thousands of streams at it. Uh, the same thing can be said about documents. The same thing can be said about um, images. Uh, if you are using like an object detection model like YOLO, you will probably get like 45 frames per second. Uh, on Tensor Lake, you can get up to like 1,000 frames per second like uh, in, a, in a serverless manner. Uh, that amount of reliability, that amount of scalability, uh, you know, we want developers to have access to when they're building generative. So the value systems. you're providing to the customer is not just to help them how to extract right information out of the PDF, but also do that at scale yeah, at, a, yeah, at, a, at a reasonable cost. Yeah. You know, they could have done this, but take a senior engineer a year, or maybe, you know, to optimize it, take forever, or maybe not able to do, but you happen to do that. Yeah, exactly. If you have hardware like GPUs, you want the GPU to be utilized all the time, right? So what it means is that, let's say like you have a couple of calls for an object detection model and a couple of calls for a PDF model, you want to batch them in a smart way such that you don't move models in and out of GPUs. Uh, those kind of things happen out of the box on Tensor Lake, right? And then security, right? If you have a document which has some RBAC controls or policies attached to them, when they are extracted, you want the same policies to be applied. You don't want like anyone having access to some data sources which they are not supposed to have when you uh, get them through a pipeline into like your RAG application. So those kind of things, you know, I, we want like engineers to have access to in a very cheap way and in a reliable way. Yeah. Simon? Yeah, awesome. Um, I think just to build on that a little bit, I think, so from our perspective, uh, what we're building is Llama Cloud, which is a developer platform for building generative AI applications. Um, I think there are two main components to that. One is almost the data foundation layer, right? That is about making it easy for the developers to connect to the data that they care about, right? So whether if you have unstructured data locked up in your SharePoint drive, or you know you have kind of uh, employee related data in your notion we want to provide the core components so that you don't have to worry about those uh, connectivity aspect right um, that kind of augmented with our proprietary like parsing solution um, will kind of take away the complexity of dealing with the parsing chunking and indexing part of the overall pipeline and I think that's an area where we believe there's it's general enough to be a horizontal platform that can be just configured to work well for different generative AI applications. And then there's a layer on top of that, which is more about orchestration and query side, and that is a lot more about business logic, right? Regard regardless of what RAG application, agent application you're building, you're really translating your business problem using a new set of tool like a fuzzy reasoning engine to be able to stitch together different components. And that part, we are providing these open source components that developers can easily kind of combine and put together to be able to realize their uh, business application. And um, we're also building towards a deployment platform in which all of our uh, open source components can be kind of packaged together and easily deployable to become microservices, right? Now, um, the main purpose of this platform, beyond like scalability and giving you good, uh, high quality context, is to enable teams in these enterprise organizations to iterate very quickly, right? We talked about, you know, we're still in the very early stage of this journey. And I think for business leaders and executive buyers, what is really important is to empower your teams to iterate faster, experiment, understand what really deliver business value without investing a ton in like manually built infrastructure to be able to kind of lock that in and then like, you know, slowly harden more of those, right? So we want to be this platform that can allow you to very quickly experiment, you know, get the right level of scalability and then still be able to harden and stay with that as the journey go on. Yeah, uh, when, when I, you know, um, just uh, heard what two of you are, have been saying, uh, it just occurred to me that both of you, right, a year ago, if we had this conversation, both of you were doing open source only, right? And then at some point, you probably realized, hey, for me to, you know, whether it be a, have a sustainable business or whatnot, you know, doing cloud is necessary. What, what was the triggering point or the moment or, you were, you, were, you were trying to do that cloud anyway from beginning, but, but, but you know, let's start with open source. What was the journey? I'm curious. Yeah, I feel 
Indexify, when we announced Indexify, you know, the people were asking us how do we run it, uh, you know, how do we get it onto the cloud like really easily. And uh, a lot of our users are software engineers, you know, and uh, the landscape in 2024 is a lot different than when I was doing open source in 2014 or 2012. And uh, now people expect everything to be managed and you know be uh, be a SaaS. Well, what's the what's the big shift uh, for 2014, 2024? I, I'm curious. Well, what's your yeah? What's your yeah? I, you know, I think we evolved like back in the day from Hadoop to yeah. Spark, and you know, people were used to running infrastructure, and now the delivery mode for so people's expectation yeah, morphed. Yeah, exactly. People's expectation has is a lot different now. So. People expect expect anything that is infrastructure to be hosted, and it needs to be serverless. You know, it needs to be consumption based. So that wasn't obvious to you at the very beginning. Yeah, exactly. Because you, yeah. you did a uh, open source for so long before, right? E exactly. Yeah, this was almost like ten years back, and you know, after that, I was at Facebook, and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's uh, the the you know it, you know, after we launched, like you know, it it made. It, made, it, it was clear to me that you know the delivery uh, mode for software Interesting. Uh, has to be serverless or you know something which. Simon, is nice. what's your journey, flipping from open source only to now? Yeah, so like both my co-founder Jay and I are very uh, we care about open source a lot. I think yep. like especially at a time where we have a new technology coming out, it's very important to give people access and educate them in some of the best practices and how to build these applications, as well as like, you know, cutting edge or newer ideas that can inspire new ways of building software, right? Um, I think having this ecosystem of people who work together to discover new ideas and tackle new use cases, I think is generally positive for the overall like landscape, right? Like, especially as a new technology, we're not fully aware of all the possible ways we can best make use of it and get value out of it so far, right? Now, kind of going towards like a cloud product, I think it's really about ease of use, right? Um, we have Did a lot of adoption. That at the very beginning? Like a year ago, let's say. Not really, to be honest. And, the, and the, <laughs> what, what made that urgency sort of a, uh, uh, yeah, what, yeah. what, what so, thing? I think like for our cloud product, we've been also very focused on, on structured data as well. Um, I think some of those, it's just a little bit harder to deliver in an open source setting, right? Like you want to host models, you run to, want to run these heavy processes, which takes multiple things being orchestrated together. Mm. And then like we, we have put a lot of that in the open source setting, but the question we get is like, okay, now how do I do this in an easy to use way? There's all these different options. Like what's the standard path or golden reference architecture that we can use to get to value quickly, right? So right now we're not saying like we're barring away from like technology that are proprietary and not in open source. It's more that we want to build a golden path or an easy way for people to get started so that they can focus on maybe the application or like application logic and tackling the business problem more than worrying about the infrastructure component and just getting high quality data or context coming from these messy right. unstructured documents. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, I right. want to say that like we are also like not getting out of open source. Indexify is licensed as Apache 2, forever going to be Apache 2, and uh, we're, we want to make it easy for people to use uh, you know our platform like he was saying. it's. It's it's about like making it easy. For yeah, people. exactly. This is the observation I made yeah, yeah, yeah. from this conversation. In that, it's not like a business model or whatnot only. It's actually you you are passionate about open source. You want people to use, but this is you know without a cloud version, a lot of people it's hard for them to consume, a lot hard for them to use. So it's almost a necessary step for you to see your open source stuff to be in good use, right? Uh, that's very interesting. So I wanted to. Also hear from you, because you deal with a lot of different um, companies, use cases. Can you just uh, tell me uh, maybe one interesting use case uh, at the application level? You see, hey, this is actually pretty interesting for generative AI, because you know, from the business point of view, right? You know, we invest, we as industry invested uh, billions, billions of dollars buying GPU, building infrastructure, potentially buy you know infrastructure software, and then build applications. Um, so far, a lot of that is about customer support or this and that. Are there anything beyond 
the usual suspects you have heard that, that you feel like, hey, this is an interesting application. And then when customer really stand it up, really put it to, into use, this is a good. So any, any interesting use case you could share with our, with our audience? Yeah, I think as a, uh, I mean, like you said, you know, most of our users, uh, we have seen them use Indexify, like our open source project for, uh, in financial settings, like banks, hedge funds, uh, some healthcare companies. Uh, but personally, as a consumer, you know, of LLMs, I find assistance to be really interesting, uh, especially software which can be personalized to me, uh, software which is personalized to the data on my phones, uh, on my phone and emails, uh, LLMs that remember about me and kind of like understand like how my day is going to look like and help me get through my day. I think. Uh, is personally interesting and so you're using that you, you are using personal assistance yourself yeah yeah and back in the day you know when I was at Facebook like we were working on uh, Facebook assistant as well and I think that's the frontier like for as a consumer is having LLM uh, deeply integrated in my um, in my um, in my life yeah cool yeah going back to the example I shared a little bit earlier right um, for investment research purpose. I think these organizations typically have a large number of analysts manually going through these reports, which are often you know, generated in a weird format for human consumption, right? These are charts and tables and natural language descriptions of you know, fund performances and things like that. And a lot of time what people are doing is really just like copying information put into a slightly different format, right? Like, take this information from this bar chart and put it into Excel to generate another model, right? So what I'm most excited about is like almost these fairly repetitive tasks that are like almost um, requires human reasoning and cognition, but it's very easy to formulate in terms of some kind of standard operating procedure, right? Like you extract information from this place, put it somewhere else, you know, run some specific set of functions, get that information and transform it something else, right? So it's almost like if you're a data engineer, this whole concept of ETL of like bringing data, transforming and putting it somewhere else. But like there's a lot of humans doing that, right? Just like across applications and across different boundaries. And a lot of those previously wasn't possible to automate because they're unstructured and we don't really know what is going on. Now with LM, we have this fuzzy reasoning engine that can you know, do a lot of those transformations with some sufficient guidance and guardrail and like it takes different formats, but like sometimes it's like a workflow that's happening under the like behind the scenes. Sometimes it's an iterative process with a human in the loop in a conversational setting. But a lot of those could be expressed in terms of primitives of like extraction or conversion, summarization, um, or like retrieval, right? So I think once you have those building blocks, a lot of those things became possible to automate, right? Like this process of building financial model, which sounds complicated, but oftentimes it's just a analyze doing a fixed set of things in standard procedure, now we can automate all of those. So I think those applications are what makes me very, very excited. Cool, so this is a good, you know, we talked about the challenges, we talked about the pathway, right? Using whether cloud solutions from you or, um, I have one last question just very briefly because we're running out of time. Um, in the last one year, what would be your biggest uh, aha moment that you felt like I didn't know you know, but I'm building this generative AI infrastructure software. I learned it, you know, some insights you would share with the audience. Um, big aha moment we haven't talked about yet. Um, I think the big aha moment was for me was that, you know, we were writing APIs where APIs were tailored for like a use case and with LLMs, unstructured data, like people are treating unstructured data as like an API. So whatever uh, data was for human consumptions is now ready to be consumed by software. And having the ability for, of LLMs to reason. And uh, you know, we have gone from chain of thoughts to like tree of thoughts to like so many different algorithms which relates to cognition. Like, you know, I, I just think uh, it has just opened up uh, of the possibility of software to be more malleable in ways that we have never seen. Okay, imagination is, you know, the, 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 the aha moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about you, Simon? Yeah, it's, it's actually very related to this malleability. It's about like 
crossing the boundaries of different applications what previously can work together. Like I think related to what I was saying, right? Like now you don't, like when you have two applications, you don't need to design an API that connect the two of them together. Now there's a way for natural language communication to happen and integrate information or to trigger actions from one to the other side, right? I think there are examples of like people building like an agent to represent each team in the organization, whether if that's like a dashboard content or whatever, now you can kind of have that information flow across silos, right? Like to be able to integrate uh, insights from different areas. So those kind of like breaking the boundaries type of use cases are very, very exciting to me. I think previously we don't have the tools or like the technology to be able to do this and we just had to have humans do it. Totally agree, you know, I kind of, from my point of view, the software can finally can see, can yeah. hear, can understand what's going on in the, you know, in the world is actually a breakthrough. So uh, thank you, Simon, thank you, Diptano. Uh, you know, in this session, we talked about the, all the challenges, right? You know, the key challenges of building out the large scale generative AI applications, you know, the pathway forward, and also exciting future we are going to see, or we are already seeing that. Uh, for the software. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, for listening, for people watching there, you know, hopefully you are even more excited after this one. Thank you.